you're just joining us and you're uh, visiting for today, I want to welcome you. So glad that you're here with us. If you're back after a while, it is good to have you back. And for all of our regulars and members, uh, we love worshiping together and it's an honor to be here with you. The book of First Peter has been a pretty wild ride so far. It was the, the letter written in about 55, 56 AD, uh, about 30, 30 years after, uh, let me do my maths, 20 or so years after Jesus went back up into heaven. Uh, after the 33 AD, 20 years, Peter was living as an apostle, as a pastor, as a church planter and working throughout Jerusalem, visiting Rome. And, and among all of this, uh, churches were being planted and the gospel was growing, but so was persecution. And so uh, as, as, as churches were being planted, there was, there was cultural pressure against them. As, as the gospel was going out, there was pushback from the world around them. But even more so, in the next couple of months and just up to a year in, in this time, 56, 55, 56 AD, the fire of Rome is going to break out, kill many, destroy thousands of homes, bring a city to ashes. And that is going to be placed blamefully onto the Christians, wrongfully, but, but the Christians are going to get the blame for it. And that's going to start an all-out war against Christian theology, belief, and Christian life. They will execute them in the streets, put them on crosses, cover them with tar, and light them on fire. This is the sort of thing that is coming. And God did not leave his people facing persecution without a letter of encouragement to give them two things. Because God knows If we're going to live the Christian life consistently, especially through suffering and especially through difficulty in life, then we need two things. A high view of our Trinitarian God. We need that. If we're going to live just just like we were just hearing, if we're going to live rightly, we need to believe the truth of God. and, and, And as our view of him rises, so can our worship, so can our obedience and our holiness. And secondly, we need, very connected to that, a clear view of what we believe about Jesus, his life and his death and his resurrection here on earth. Because that gives to us not just a hope in the future, a belief of our salvation and assurance for what's coming, but also an example to live out in this life as we go. We can look to Jesus, how he suffered, how he died, how he walked, and we can find for ourselves an example. Peter has been talking about holiness in the last a uh, few verses, from about verse 13 onwards, he's saying that, that if you're a Christian, then your response to God and how you live for God ought to reflect the significance of what God has done for you. What we do for God in this life ought to reflect the weightiness of what God has done for us in the gospel. Our response has to be devotion to God, away from sin and into holiness. And and the last few uh, chunks of verses, he's been going through reasons to pursue that because God is a disciplining God, because he's a holy God that we love to be like as our father, because the cost of your redemption, as we looked at last week, was not just gold, was not even just thousands and thousands of sheep and goats, precious as that may be, but the blood of his only son, Jesus Christ, given for you, full atonement we received as we just sang so gloriously. That, that's the cost. And, and finally, one of the, the, the motivations for holiness that Peter's going to give here is that the gospel that we've received, the gospel that has been manifested in, in recent times for Peter, in these last times in Jesus' life, it is an eternal plan of God. It, it has been the long, eternal, infinite desire of God to bring this to completion. And so he's going to put our minds there, and, and we're going to bring three things out of it. We're going to learn, because we believe in the eternal plan of God in Christ, this magnifies our view of the gospel. It, it explodes your view of the glory of the gospel when you believe in its eternality in the heart of God. It will also intensify your relationship to God. When you see what his heart has been for so long, it will intensify your relationship to God. It will magnify your view of the gospel. It will intensify your relationship to God. And thirdly, it will solidify your hope and your faith. They're the three things we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to jump right in. I'm going to read verse 20 and 21 for us. You can follow along or see it on the screen. The word of God, inerrant, infallible, and complete, says this. He, that's talking about Jesus, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times 
for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Short section today, I promise you, I'll make 40 minutes of it, don't worry. Number one, when we look at this verse, I want to see that you believing in the eternal plan of God magnifies your view of the gospel. Did you know that the gospel was foreknown by God? This verse says, he was foreknown. Now, when we start talking about the plan of God in eternity and his uh, planning things and destining things or predetermining things, maybe a pushback. Maybe someone would look at this and say, well, it's, it's not all the things and specifics that would happen. It's not the gospel that was foreknown and, and all planned before the world, but it says Jesus was foreknown. See, it says in your verse, he was foreknown. And of course, we, that's, that's just saying that the Father knows the Son in, in the Trinity. If you're new to Christianity or, or, or you're unfamiliar with a lot of what we believe, uh, uh, we, we have always believed that God is three persons in one God. We, we call this the Trinity. It's, we love it. It comes into all major doctrines. It's, it's beautiful. We, we don't believe in three gods, but one God, one nature, eternally existent in three persons, what we call the Godhead. And maybe you look at that and say, well, of course the Father foreknew the Son. They were eternally existent together before the foundations of the world. That's what it means, that he was foreknown. But look at verse 19 in your Bible there for a bit of context. Verse 19 says to us that it's talking about Christ and says, Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown. This Christ as a lamb was foreknown. It doesn't say that God the Son, external to the plan of redemption, was foreknown. Of course, he was known. But this word foreknown is a planning, a knowing beforehand in order to bring about in the future. And it's not just God the Son who is foreknown, but it is him in his role as Christ, meaning anointed one, meaning the sent one for salvation. It's Jesus as the Lamb of God foreknown. The Father knew the Lamb before the foundations of the world. It's not just that the Father and Son knew each other in the Trinity, but that the Lamb was foreknown from bef- uh, was foreknown in this whole plan. It, we looked last week at how the Lamb of God, Jesus, uh, uh, procures for us our salvation in all of those amazing ways shown in the Old Testament. That whole way of salvation, this is what Peter's saying, the whole gospel, the plan of the Lamb to take the sin, that was foreknown. That's what he's saying. Do you, do you view your salvation this way? Do you view the gospel this way? Or, or do you kind of see it as maybe a plan B of God? That the Garden of Eden didn't work out. Adam took a, a wrong turn. God didn't know what to do. And so threw down his son, cr- crossing his fingers, hoping everything worked out. Or, or that he sent Jesus and, and let people kill him and just told, told his son, just, just hang out, I'll figure something out. Oh no, they're going to pin him to a cross. That's not the plan. Here, I'll throw their sin on you. You can die for them. There you go, salvation. Do, do you see salvation as maybe, or maybe you've not really thought about it. You need to see that this whole outworking of the gospel has been foreknown by God, predetermined, planned beforehand. And this will magnify our view of the gospel. It's... It's also, maybe we need to, we need to think, it, maybe you hear that and say, okay, Peter's saying it was all this lamb plan, the salvation was foreknown. Kind of like you make a, a family holiday and you know the nature of family and traffic and times and all of that and how, how, uh, 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 how unforetold it all is. And so you make a vague plan. You know, we'll get to Gympie more or less around 4 p.m., probably more like 8 p.m., pitch our tent in the dark. Uh, more or less, we'll, we'll sleep there. I don't know about the rain. And, and there's these vague plans for a family holiday. Maybe you think of salvation that way, that, that God sort of foreknew what he would hope to do, uh, and then it, it worked or it didn't. Turns out it did. That's good. No, look, look, let's look also, just cast your mind back, not to Peter's first letter, but Peter's first ever sermon. On the day of Pentecost, as the Spirit came and filled people with doing miraculous things, he filled Peter... And the first sermon ever preached in the New Testament after Jesus has been ascended is Peter the Apostle, our same writer, standing up in front of thousands of people and preaching to them. This has been Peter's theology the whole time along. Here's what he says in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. He's talking about the Jews having killed Jesus. 
He's, he's saying Jesus, this Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, who you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. When we say that he, as a lamb, as the Christ, was foreknown, Peter's other time of using this word, saying it was all foreknown, gives us the context that he's talking about a definite and particular exact plan of salvation. That the people who would start the nation of Rome were all foreknown and planned by God. That the process of the crucifixion cross coming into existence throughout history, that was foreknown and planned by God. The very particulars of who would drive the nails through the hand. Who would be buying for Jesus a grave to lie in? Who would help carry his cross? Who would be in charge, legally speaking, over those uh, 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 judgments over Jesus? All of those things exactly and particularly planned by God. This is our salvation. This is the gospel we're a part of. Not some plan B, not some uh, throw it together piece of planning, but exact plan. And when was this planned? When we think about God planning beforehand, how far back do we go? You know, if you, if you swing back to the book of Matthew, first chapter, and then go one more page over, then what you'll find is maybe if, if you've got a, an informative Bible, it'll tell you that this is the intertestamental period. Between the Old Testament being written, finished, and the New Testament starting when John the Baptist hit the scene, it was about 400 years. Maybe you go, God foreplanned the New Testament and gospel. Then. It took him 400 years. There was silence. No prophet from heaven. But that's when he planned it all. He realized the whole Old Testament was no good. Kept on stuffing up. So he took 400 years, planned a new gospel. Or maybe you think, maybe back a little bit, back in Egypt, when his people who he'd promised the land to, they were slaves for 400 years. Maybe that was when God was planning this cross. That far in advance. 15, 900 years. 1,900 years in advance, God was planning the cross. Or, or maybe it was the flood when God just wiped out everybody, said, I've got a new plan now. I'm going to start with Noah. Do it all. I've predetermined a plan now. He started back at the cross. Maybe it was then. Or maybe it was, it was, it was so far back, it was in the Garden of Eden that as God had made this beautiful world and Adam threw it all down into the sinful dust, God in that moment instantly thought up a plan to send the seed, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who would save every that far back? Are we talking that far back when God foreknew his plan of the Lamb? Well, Peter can answer us. God can answer us with his scripture. He said that it was before the foundations of the world. When was Jesus Christ as our Savior, as the Lamb foreknown? Before the foundations were laid for this earth, including the foundation element of time. If you can, try and wrap your head around the time before time. You and I have brains created in time. We can't do that. Every thought that we have is enwrapped in time measures. But, but imagine the, time, the, the period, the, the something, that whatever it was before time, that's the period we're talking about. We call it eternity past. Whatever it was, it was before time. That's when nothing but the triune God existed. And what was he doing? He was planning salvation. In the gospel, and in we, we've been going through this uh, Bible studies, if you've been heading along to those, you've seen them in our statement of faith, but in the gospel, we believe, as Christians, that the Trinity, the triune God, each member of the Trinity really enacts a, a, a particular and distinct role in salvation. So, for example, it wasn't the Father who took on a body and died on the cross for us. That was the Son of course, the Father was playing a role, but it was the person of the Son who came, that distinct roles. That it's not the Holy Spirit who is raised as king in heaven, but it's Jesus. That it's not the Son who is sent to, to fill us, uh, but it is the Holy Spirit. They have distinct roles. And what we see is that as we look through Scripture, and, and theologians have called this the covenant of redemption. We see that, that there are certain roles uh, between uh, the Trinity According to a very particular pact or promise or organized uh, uh, promise together before the foundations of the world between the Father and the Son, as we look through the Psalms and we see these pictures of God speaking to his Messiah, 
and talking about the covenant I made with you. Or as we look through the book of Hebrews, which show us all the the promises that the Father has made to the Son. Or even as we look through the Gospels and we see the way that Jesus speaks about things that the Father has sent me to do, or or as the Father has promised me. These kind of things show and and shadow for us. This, we can't talk about it in, in, uh, in anything other than human language, and so it kind of breaks down. But we, we picture, in our human minds, the Father and the Son having a conversation of agreement. The Father making promises and giving conditions. And the Son agreeing to it, agreeing to every part of the Father's promise and conditions. Things like, you will go and you will be the people's surety or a guarantor. If you've ever applied for a loan that's too big for you, or maybe in, in business you've, you've gone for something and asked the bank for however much money, uh, what they might have done, if they're not fully convinced in your ability to pay, they will allow you to take the loan and make the repayments as long as underneath your name on the contract is a second signature, the signature of your guarantor. Somebody who, in this covenant, in this pact, if you fail to meet your requirements, the the funds, the fees, the debts will fall onto them. Maybe you've engaged in that, or maybe this is the first time you're hearing about that sort of thing. Uh, I've never gotten that much money out of the bank. So, but that's what they do. They say it's too too much of a cost. We need somebody to assure us, who is worth a lot, who, that you will be able to make the payments. This is how theologians talk about the the role of Jesus in that covenant of redemption. The promise made between the Father and the Son before the foundations of the world, Jesus agreed to be the surety or the guarantor for us, his people. Saying, whatever debts they incur, I agree, Father, I will take them on. Whatever penalty is deserved, I agree, Father, I will take them on. Whatever is needed to be done, I agree, I will do it. I will go down, take up a body, live a perfect life, go to the cross in obedience, die for them, and the Father's promises back, and I will raise you from the dead. You might remember the psalm. I will not let my Holy One see corruption. His body will not rot. And so God fulfills all of his promises on the basis of the Son's obedience. This is the covenant of redemption. What this... It may just seem like something abstract, strange, odd, but it's here in Scripture, and we know God speaks for purposes. What I know is that as we look at this, we see see a God acting completely freely. It says a lot about somebody, what they do when they have complete free time, no obligations, and no needs or demands placed on them. What do you do? You're on a holiday, or, or... or maybe you're getting spending money for Christmas or something, and somebody asks you, you can do anything you want, what would you do? Think this back a little bit into eternity past with God. Completely free, completely omnipotent, able to show and magnify his glory however he wants. And what does he do? What does he choose out of the own freedom of his heart? Sin isn't here yet. The devil hasn't stuffed anything up yet. There's nothing but God and his own desirous heart. And what does he do? He says, I want to display my glory through a crucified lamb saving a sinful people for worship in eternity. Even the nature of the cross was not thought up after sin came into the world. But the Father had planned what would be. He even planned that this world would fall into sin and yet not causing it. He planned that all these things would come out for good eventually. He would work all things, bringing the whole history to climax at the cross. Our God wanted the cross to happen. It was not a by-thought. Have you ever seen maybe State of Origin or the Rugby League Grand Final? When, when, when for some reason it's in the last minutes, the intensity's up, the energy's high, and for some reason the prop has found himself out on the wing, and he's there in the height of it and the heat of it, and, and, and the dummy throws a long one out to the prop. And he's only 10 meters from his line, and he catches it full pace, but it's not a solid catch. 
And the size and weight and agility that he has is not doing him favors. And over those last 10 meters, he's tripping and falling, almost head over heels, but not fully losing control of the ball, gripping it just at the last minute to fall down face first. But his fingers are putting downward pressure on the ball, and so the referee calls it a try. He secures the win, and everybody's going crazy. He couldn't do it again if he tried. And if the coach had his say, he would never have the prop on the wing again, never, but, okay, we're glad it worked out. And you could say to the coach or to the captain, the dummy, or maybe even the prop, if you could do it again, would it go that way? He goes, no, don't do it that way. That was lucky. If God could have his eternity over again, if he could have an eternity of eternities over again, he would always plan for the cross to happen. He wanted to show his love, grace, power, justice, and mercy in the cross. It was not God's arm behind his back. The cross was God's design. Do you believe that, Christian? Having this view will take your mind off, off any kind of uh, low thoughts of the gospel. Believing this about the gospel will, will put you in place, in, in your right place in, in history. You are not some second thought after Adam fell, but the thought of God from all eternity as he plans to show his glory through the cross. In talking about this verse, Calvin has this really awesome line. He says, novelty is suspicious. And what he goes on to explain is, is this notion that as exciting sometimes as spontaneity is, it can't be trusted. If you were maybe dating a, uh, uh, somebody and, and it got to you know, real early days, six days, you've gone on two dates in six days, that's pretty good. He's taken you on six dates, and then the third date, Saturday night, he, he takes you out on a helicopter ride over Brisbane City, has, has, has fireworks go up over the mountain uh, of Mount Kutha for you, and then you parachute out of the helicopter 14,000 feet over a field of flowers that have been grown to say, will you marry me? <laughs> now, as you're plummeting towards the earth, wind drying your saliva and making you look quite ugly, surely at some point, what crosses through your mind among all of the racing emotions and, and heat of love and affections and wow, look at the ring that he's holding out to me. It's a massive rock. Surely at some point you would also think, hang on, six days? He can be one with this much affection and love and passion in six days? And if that woman falling to the earth has enough wisdom and, and, and uh, insight, she might also just think, when everything cools down, can I be sure it won't also take six days to lose this affection? Can I be sure that it won't just also take six days for his eyes to be caught by a woman at work that he sees maybe more often than me. That spontaneity is, is great. We love it. But it can't be trusted if that's the pattern. And what Calvin gets at in this verse is he's saying, you might have a view of God who throw away predestination, throw away predetermination. My God worked with what he had and he brought about this last minute great salvation. But how do you know Halfway through eternity, future, he won't just come up with something else. Or, or how do you know that halfway through church history, there won't be some new novelty that God comes up with an even better plan? How do you know that? You know that because this is an eternal plan from the beginning. And given his eternity over and over again, he would make the same decisions. This should be our view of the gospel. I hope it's yours. It's so assuring to everyone who holds it. That's, he was foreknown from the before, the foundations of the earth, and manifest in this last time for the sake of you. Let's look at how this intensifies your relationship with God. In the end of verse 20, he says that he was made manifest for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God. Why? What? Think about the whys of all of this. Why did God plan all of this so long ago and then bring it about despite the cost? And you might say, well, because he really hated evil and he wanted to put it away. Okay, sure. Yes, true. Well, because he really wanted to show Satan and beat him and put him away. Yes, true. But Peter says this eternal plan and 
and then historical manifestation of it all is for the sake of you. That your sins might be paid for. That your death might be taken in Jesus. That your assurance might be given to you. That you might have an example to live by. That you will have a promise of perseverance. That you can receive uh, resurrection life. That you will be restored and reconciled to God. For whose sake was, was all of this done? For you. That We believe it was for the glory of God. That's why he does all things. But you've misread scripture if you don't see that God has interwoven his glory with your joyful good. And so if he ever wants to rise up our joy and good, he must first raise up the glory that he shows to, of himself. That if he ever wants to glorify himself, he will in that moment also be giving us our greatest good and joy because it is the, it is the Christian's born again experience that witnessing the glory of God is the height of your joy. And so when he says here, he did all this for your sake. Don't feel like you're being selfish there. He did all of this for the sake of the objects of his love. This is God's love towards you. Your sake. Well, who is you? There's many of us here today. That There's literally millions who will read this text from Peter. Who is the you? He says next, he says, for you who through him are believers. The believers. Believers only are the sake that is bettered by this gospel. Where are you today? Would you be able to say with confidence, I'm one of them. I'm a believer. And for, more, for my sake, he died. Because if not, if you're not a believer, then your sake is no better. Maybe you would say, well, I'm not a believer yet. I'm an, I'm an observer. I'm, I'm checking out this gospel. I'm looking at things, and, and I'm just seeing how things play out. And, and we welcome you all here. And if you're an observer standing far off, God's command to you today would be, come near to him and embrace what you have been viewing. Come and receive what you have been thinking about. This is not a gospel that saves by seeing it but a gospel that saves by embracing it. Just as bread does you no good by seeing it, but only gives you its nutritional value by taking it into yourself. So please, observe yes, but take Jesus in. Or maybe today you say, a believer in God? No. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually, if I can be honest, and maybe without the, the hearing of my parents or my children even, or, or the friends who brought me, I'm, I'm a pretender. I know a whole lot of this stuff, but I know one thing for sure, that I am not in Jesus, enjoying his salvation and believing for my salvation. And, and if that's you today, then, then God wants to meet you. Peter wants to speak to you and say, become a believer. What do you think you need to do in order to become someone who this can be for? There's nothing. There's no shame that you might have mounted up. There's no embarrassment that is too high that, that you shouldn't go through that in order to come to Jesus. But today, through Jesus, believe in God. And all of this, of God's eternal purpose, becomes for your sake. Or maybe, maybe you say, I'm not a believer, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner, not one of these believers. And I say, good if you are a sinner, then you are just the closest thing to a Christian as you can be. Because a sinner is the only type of person that God foresaw and predestined to love. A sinner is the only type of person who Jesus came to die for. And a sinner is the only type of person that is accepted into the holy, loving arms of God. If you are a sinner, then you have not been asked to become a, a doer, a law observer, a, a church goer, a, a rule keeper. You have been asked to believe, to simply receive and say, all of this, what must I do to receive all of this glory from God? Simply accept it. Believe it to be true. Believe that God wants you to be saved and has done all of this in your place. Believe that. And eternal salvation is yours. Believers in God. That is who receives all of this. But I want to point here that when it says believers in God, it uses that word God there. 
it uses the Greek word theos, which is the, just the generic name for God. Uh, and when, it's, when the New Testament says that, it's almost always talking about the Father. It'll usually call Jesus Lord or Savior, all sorts of other things. But, but when it just uses this word, it often talks about the Father. And I want to maybe, maybe speak to us who, who might have a somewhat twisted view or, or relationship with the Father. Maybe because you've had experiences of your father and it hasn't been good or, or you simply approach God in this kind of sense. That, that he's fearful and angry and will judge, but I'm just so thankful that in love Jesus stood in and saves me from that angry God. That I, in all of my sin, can't go to the father, but can come to Jesus and there I will live. And, and if ever God was to, to look on me, I, I, would, I would run. He would destroy me if he could. It's kind of like, it's kind of like God is, is the owner of a house. He, he's the father. And Jesus is coming home as the eldest son to a father looking very annoyed and very disappointed because Jesus is bringing with him all these sinners. And Jesus says, Father, you had a loophole. You said that anyone who believes in me will be saved. They believe in me. Can they come in? And the father, disappointed with the, the, the type and the quality and the filthiness of the sinners who are walking in through his front door, says, okay, loophole, I'll honor that. Get in, keep him out of my sight. Is that maybe, maybe a taste of, of your view to the father? When, when there was a, uh, in the 1900s, there was a man called Gerhardus Voss, and he was a theologian who would write, and he was talking about this love of the Father to us. And among many points, he said two things. He said that the Father, the cross of Christ, don't think about it this way. The cross did not buy you the Father's love. The cross of Christ, let's say it another way, did not earn the Father's love for you. The cross of Christ shows the love of God the Father for you. It is an expression, not an earning of God's love. It, again, this is his eternal plan. It's not as if, if he could have it his way, he'd get rid of Jesus' old stinking cross and kill all of these sinners, if we can speak so candidly. But he has desired this. He said a second thing. He said, if ever we would fear that, that God's love might stop. He's talking about, maybe you're a Christian who's struggled with that. Uh, God has saved me. He loves me. Will he love me tomorrow? Are you playing the daisy game? He loves me, he loves me not. I've sinned, he loves me, he loves me not. Listen to this. The best proof that God will never cease to love us lies in that he never began. The best proof that God will never stop loving you is that he never began loving you. Beginning is a time word. God did not to begin to love you. He has always loved you. As long as God has been God in eternity past, he has loved his covenant people. Have, have you that view of God, that, that maybe he existed in all this happiness, then thought of us, then brought about the gospel, and now here we are? Would you have the gospel confidence to say God's love and eternal love, his plan and gospel and eternal love and gospel and plan, he has loved me for eternity. Before I sinned, before I existed physically, he loved me. He never began to love me. May your affections, as you think of, of your relationship to the Father and how God sees you, be stirred and intensified by this view of God's eternal love gospel. I think that would be Peter's hope. That would be why Peter's saying this. This is the flow of his letter. And lastly, it, in, it magnifies, this view of the gospel magnifies our view of the gospel. It intensifies our relationship to God, and it solidifies your faith and your hope. Can you look at me at the last part of verse 21? Verse 21 says, who, this is speaking of God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Is that clear? Is that really clear how, how Jesus, ra Jesus was raised from the dead in order for you to have hope and glory? Uh, sorry, faith and hope. 
Does that, is the connection clear? Here's what Peter's showing us. God had planned from eternity past to do this work of salvation through Jesus on the cross. Did it happen or did it not? Which one of the promises can you point to saying, the Father promised the Son these things, but only a small amount of them were done? Can you look to a single promise in Scripture towards Christ and the Messiah, whether prophecies or reflections of the New Testament writers, can you find a single promise that wasn't met? No. Because what God foreknows and promises do happen. If ever we doubt that, we look back to the cross and say all of them were met. All of God's promises were answered and did occur. And and so this gives us faith now and future hope. So, So what hope is for the future, faith is for the present. Hope is a certainty of things you can't see that are coming later. Faith is a certainty of things you can't see that are true right now. Faith is right now certainty of what is unseen, and hope is certainty of what is unseen, but coming later. Looking back, realizing all of God's promises answered in Christ, in his resurrection and being raised to glory, give us this hope and faith. That what happened when God ordained the Lamb to be manifest? He was manifest. What happened when God ordained the lamb to die? He died. What happened when God ordained the lamb to rise? You bet it, he rose. What about to be enthroned and given glory in heaven? Yes, Peter says that happened. And so all of our, the, the promises for him in the future must also be true, that he will be uh, sent back, that he will judge the world, that he will be uh, punishing the unbelievers in the smoke of his fury forever, and that he will be worshipped in heaven forever. All of these things are true because all of God's other promises have proven God to be a covenant-keeping God. Where does that leave us? It leaves us realizing anything that God promises Anything that God foreknows are certain to happen. There is no ifs or buts. The only reason for doubt is our own ignorance of the promises. So so that these promises, if you know these and you know God's certainty, what happens when God ordains something, foreknows something? They certainly happen. God, Peter tells us back in verse 1 and 2, that we believers are foreknown, that we are elect and chosen according to God's foreknowledge. That will definitely happen. You will come into salvation. Jesus has said that all who believe in him will not be put to shame. Believe that with God's certain promise, that he will use his word in our lives to bring us to greater glory, bring us into sanctification, growth and strength. That is certain. Believe it. That he will use all things, as Romans 8.28 says, to our good. Including, maybe, maybe the one little caveat to that is, God will use all things for your good unless you're massacred. Unlucky. That's the one, that's the one, that one won't work. Just in case any Christian would ever have that, that loss of hope. God's own son, he let be massacred. And then shows us in this book of Peter that from there he was clothed with life and risen to glory. Even the darkest day in the Christian's life is wrapped up with the promises of God and the example of Jesus of what happens when God foreknows and plans things. Kevin DeYoung talking about this whole reality when he's talking about this eternal gospel, the fact that the Father and the Son were in covenant together to do this. He talks about how, how, confident, how, how much confidence it can give us. He says, it gives the believer confidence that because our covenant relationship with God has its origin in the Father's pre-time covenant relationship with the Son, we don't have to merit our salvation or hold it afloat, but can rest secure in Christ, our benefactor. This is what, this view of the gospel, this eternal reality of Jesus coming and dying for us is not just some theological point that people argue about in seminaries. 
It is, the, it is the truth for the sheep and the workers and the Christians in Turkey in those days, in Logan in these days. It is for us as we go through life. It will magnify your view of the great gospel. It will intensify your relationship to our great God. And it will solidify for you hope and faith because none of God's purposes can fail. I'm going to pray for us. Father, our great God, every time we try and wrap our minds around or speak about your gospel and your son and the glories that you've shown, we will fall so short. We know that God, in every sermon, in every prayer, in every thought about you, there's, there's enough sin and ignorance to condemn us. Even our highest praise and our, at our greatest understandings falls so far short of you and requires so much grace of you to accept. Father, your gospel is eternal and magnificent. Forgive us, God, when we as individuals or a church or as, as people and families have thought low thoughts of your gospel to the point of, of keeping it to ourselves and, and not spreading it to, to the degree that we would think lowly about your bride who has been purchased at such a cost in such a plan or ways that we mingle with sin and friendship with the world, not realizing we're butting against your eternal plan we are undoing the good that could be ours if we would walk according to your eternal plan that you've shown to us. God, I pray that in every heart now we would, we would have conviction and confession of our deepest sins and our darkest things knowing that you have seen them, not just when we did them, but you saw them and sent Christ even before the foundations of the world. Would you clear consciences this morning, God, by the, the sprinkling of Christ's blood onto our, onto our souls? Would you please give to us an assurance that, yes, I have sinned in this and so many ways, but so Jesus lived and died for me. I have him as my guarantor. God, if there is, is weak or, or trembling or shaking faith in this room, I pray, God, that you would give to us strength by this, by seeing how true it is, your, your eternal plan of the gospel. Would you solidify us and give us the boldness of faith and give us the, the full assurance of hope, which you call an anchor to our soul? Would you make weak Christians strong, immature Christians mature, people who are only blind followers? Would you give them their own sight and vision of your glory and make them leaders? God, would you make husbands struggling to lead strong in your leadership? Would you make people struggling to love brothers and sisters, able to pour out their life even to death for the love of the brethren because they see the worth and value of your gospel? Would you bring us even considering sin now and thinking of how temptation will meet us this week? Will you remind to us, assure every soul, that whatever the strength of the temptation coming, a stronger God promises to be with me. Please, God, make us a people walking and dancing and living and fighting on the promises that you have given to us in Scripture. God, I pray for, for doubting souls or, or those who see themselves outside of Jesus. I pray that today, God, you would give to them salvation, knowing that there is nothing they can bring, nothing that they can offer to you, nothing that you demand, you only demand Jesus, and that by belief they receive all of him. God, please give faith this morning. God, we thank you for the promises you make to us, the love that you show to us, and the way that you will be with us in this new and coming week. Whatever struggles come, we trust that you will use it for your glory and in that all of our good. We praise you, Jesus. We cannot wait for the day of heaven when we praise you with loosened tongues and unsinful bodies and clear minds. And for eternity, we will be there looking on you in perfect bliss, praising you. We thank you for that promise, O oh God. And all the people who believed that said, Amen.